so we've been basically arguing the Mosaic Covenant is a gracious covenant, but it, but it is not an unconditional covenant. You know, I argued the Abrahamic Covenant is ultimately unconditional with conditional elements. Ultimately unconditional with conditional elements. This covenant is wholly conditional. However, it's gracious in that God delivered the people. He loved his people. He, he brought them into Egypt and then gave them <clears throat> covenant blessings. But there's defects in the covenant. And most of Israel left Egypt unsaved. That's one defect in the covenant. They're physically delivered, but not spiritually transformed. That typological difference is crucial in understanding election and perseverance. So that, that, is, that has huge implications for systematics. How so? God elected Israel to be his people covenantally as a theocratic entity, but not everyone who's elected was saved, right? The new covenant community is of a different nature because the new covenant believers that are chosen, they're not a, they're not a nation or a people group, right? They're, they're people from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Everybody in the New Covenant community, everybody who's truly a member of the New Covenant community is elect and is saved. So, so again, some Arminians want to point back to Israel being elect and people apostatizing and then saying that can be true for the New Covenant community, you see. But there's a discontinuity there that's very important to see. And I think we see that in biblical theology itself. The elect nation doesn't mean they're all spiritually saved, I would argue. So that typological difference is crucial in understanding election and perseverance. So they're given a question. So I guess I would agree, right? So, yeah. So. We also see that the law without the spirit kills. I think that's what Paul says, right? But it, we see that in the story, don't we? You give people a law, you give people a law, but if they're not regenerate, if they don't have the spirit, it kills them. Now, I think some were regenerate in Israel. Here, here I like, I'm really... Maybe. I think Jim Hamilton ought to send me a check or something. I'm, because I really like Jim Hamilton's book, um, and I always forget the title of it. Uh, does anybody know He is With You But Not In You or something like that? What, do you know that book? You never heard of that book? So Jim argues that Old Testament saints were regenerated and not indwelt in this book he wrote. It, it was actually a dissertation he wrote under me, but he and eventually published it. And... Uh, I, I think that's the right way to put it, but, uh, but, but the majority in Israel were unregenerate. So the law, the, the, when, the law, when the law hits an unregenerate heart, it kills the unregenerate person, right? The, the letter kills, Paul says, right? But the spirit gives life. The law without the spirit. So Israel, Israel was stiff-necked. I think that's a way of saying most in Israel were unregenerate. And the, and the, and the, story, the, the story that really uh, drives that home is the story of Exodus 32 through 34, right? The, the, the ink on the covenant, so to speak, is not even dry. Well, it's not even been brought down yet. And they immediately, they've just said to the Lord, everything you say will do, and they immediately make a golden calf. <laughs> They immediately violate the covenant in a, in a very profound way. So, you know, this is a very interesting thing. The rabbis talked about this a lot. 
the, the rabbis talked about why is it that right when the covenant was signed, so to speak, we immediately broke it. And, and Moses comes down and shatters the tablets, which symbolizes what? The covenant's broken, right? The covenant's broken right when it's signed. Well, it's renewed there too, right? He brings the tablets down again. The covenant's renewed. But it shows us, you know, here's my point here. It shows us Israel's unregenerate, doesn't it? Mainly. So we need eschatological intervention, end time intervention, and that's going to happen in the new covenant. There's defects in the old covenant. There's no defect in God. That was God's plan. But that's, that's, very, that's very important to understand the storyline. Then we have the tabernacle. That, of course, that's God's presence with his people. That's not hard to understand. Psalm 84, how lovely is your dwelling place. That's the divine presence. So I, I'm mentioning books here. Um, I don't know if you know this book by, um, maybe I'll put it in a different font so you can read it easier. Uh, there's a book by Ryan Lister, and I forget the exact title. You, you see, I'm terrible at titles, but on the divine presence. He, Ryan traces in scripture the theme of divine presence. Do you, do you have the title? Oh, yeah. Well, I won't give the whole title, but let's let's write that a little bit. What is it called? So th that's a very helpful little book. Well, it's not that little. No. I just think I wrote the foreword. Yeah, yeah. So, but that's so. So this is that's what the tabernacle is all about, right? God's presence. Yeah. I agree. The, but, but we're talking about the minority. See, the majority were unregenerate and not indwelt. But there were some that were godly. Those who were godly were, were regenerate, but not indwelt. No, 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 they were saved. If you're regenerate, you're saved. Well, there's a big debate on that, right? At least typically, at least typically, people have said that the indwelling of the Spirit comes in the New Covenant because John the Baptist says, I can't baptize you with the Spirit. Jesus says, the Spirit will not come until I'm exalted, John 16, right? So th that's, why, that's, that's why Hamilton argues the way he does. How do you explain those texts? Why doesn't Jesus just say, yeah, people have always been getting the Spirit, but he says, I can't give you the Spirit until I'm exalted and ascended. So that the Spirit regenerates people all through salvation history, but the gift of the indwelling of the Spirit comes after the resurrection and ascension. Does that make sense? Yeah. Any other questions on that? Okay, good, great, good question. effect of don't take your spirit from me uh, that's that's distinct from being as well that's just a temporary kind of movement of the spirit in his life yeah you yeah, know the spirit uh, the spirit abiding with him I take it yeah I mean it's a difficult question good people disagree I, mean, I, I think I already mentioned I was in John Piper's church for 11 years John's a good friend um, John John believes Old Testament saints were indwelt by the spirit and so it's certainly a possible reading. I mean, I, I, it's not the clearest thing in the world, but I, but I think it's hard to explain those other texts. That's all. So you know, good people land at different places on that question. For it's not easy. <laughs> yeah. Not or sealed like the New Testament. They're, right, that's exactly what Hamilton argues. They're regenerated by the Spirit, but not indwelled. I mean, yeah. They uh, still sing uh, effectualness 
the spirit of the, those who are accusing us. The Holy Spirit on the hearts is they also once saved, always saved. Yeah. Yeah, once they're saved, once they're regenerated, they don't lose it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. You know, the altar of incense is like the cloud of God's presence in the wilderness, representing both God's imminence and transcendence, right? God's with his people, and yet there's a cloud, right? He's not just seen straight on. The fire burning on the altar may symbolize God as a consuming fire. We have the cherubim again. We talked about the cherubim. The cherubim represent the place where God rules. You know, we're just looking at high points. We're going fast. God's presence can't be entered casually. There's compartments designed to thwart the eruption a profane experience into the zone of the sacred. So, 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 you know, what we mean by compartments, right? There's the outer court, the holy place, and the most holy place. And we see some, some argue, and I, I'm, I, I think this is right, the outer court represents the earthly world, the holy place, the skies, the most holy place, the place where God dwells. So the, so the, the tabernacle is a representation of the cosmos, of the world, you know? The world itself and God's presence with his people. And it, so it, 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 um, it points to, right, the, the, that finally in Revelation 21 and 22, in the new temple, the new temple is the new creation, the new heavens and earth. God will dwell the, and dwell the whole thing. The whole creation will be represent God's presence. I talked about the golden calf incident. You know, I talk here about Jesus identifies himself as the temple. So, so you know, this is what I mean by canonical reading. The temple, finally, the temple is Jesus himself, right? And, and, and then those who belong to Jesus, the church is his temple. And then in the new Jerusalem, right, Revelation 21 and 22, there is no temple. God and the Lamb are the temple. The dimensions of the New Jerusalem are a cube, right, representing, signifying the Holy of Holies. So, um, listen to that. Rain in Southern California. I hear it. It's a miracle. So, anyway. But isn't that fascinating? Now, maybe we... Yeah, Revelation is a very complex book, isn't it? And I realize that you may have a different re reading of Revelation than I do. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how you understand the new creation text, but I understand. I understand Revelation twenty-one and twenty-two to be highly symbolic. Um, I mean, we we could talk about that more. But when when he says the New Jerusalem is a cube, that's what the Holy of Holies was, right? The perfect measurements, and so so. That's a way of saying God's, God's indwelling the whole of the new creation. All of it's his temple now. All of it's his tabernacle. All of it's indwelt by him. So, but it begins just in a little tabernacle and temple, right? Where his special presence resides. But, but, but then, so this is huge for my biblical theology. Then that's fulfilled in Jesus, Right? then in his people, and finally in the whole of the new creation. So what we see, what we see typologically, typologically there's a pattern and correspondence, but in typology there's always escalation, right? So let me use that word, put that word down here, escalation. So we have a pattern and a correspondence but it's escalated. In other words, Jesus is greater than the tabernacle and the temple, right? The fulfillment is always greater than the type. You have animal sacrifices, right? We're going to talk about that in a minute. You have animal sacrifices. Jesus' sacrifice is greater than the animal sacrifices. The fulfillment is always greater than the type. It escalates when we get to the fulfillment. 
That's, that's the point I'm making here. Okay, so going really fast, right? Exodus, anything you want to say about Exodus? Let's talk about Leviticus. So Exodus ends. Exodus ends. You have God's presence in the tabernacle. Leviticus tells us how can God's presence be maintained. Now, there's a new book out on Leviticus. Have any of you seen it by Michael Morales? How many of any of you seen that book? The New Studies of Biblical Theology series. That's a that's a that's a really excellent book by Michael Morales. So I recommend Michael's book to you as a very profound found reading of the book of, of Leviticus. How, so Exodus ends, God's presence is with his people, right? How, how do you maintain that presence? So you, what we see in Leviticus is we see the holiness, the holiness of Yahweh. Um, and yeah, is a very key verse for Leviticus 26.12. I will walk among you and be your God, and you will be my people. I'm going to tabernacle among you. Wait, what's the, I forgot here. What's the Hebrew there? Yeah, it's just walk. Yeah, I guess there's nothing really special. And what's, uh, not, no, 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 I want the all exacts. Yeah, I'll walk among you. And by the way, that's quoted in uh, 2 Corinthians 7, or 6. It's picked up there. I can take those out. We don't need those. John Hartley, who teaches at Azusa Pacific, uh, John's probably retired now. I don't even know if John's alive now because he was, when I was 32 years old, John was probably in his 50s. But John has a commentary on Leviticus. Uh, I don't agree with everything John says about things, but I like what he says in his commentary that uh, Leviticus speaks of the happiness and wonder of being in the Lord's presence. It's interesting, you know, you have the word tent of meeting 41 times in Leviticus. That's where you meet God, God's presence, right? The glory and wonder of his presence. But you must not profane God's name. Here's Hartley again. It is little wonder that the vision of the holy God is both awe-inspiring and frighteningly terrible. Isn't that a beautiful sentence? Humans either retreat in dread or bow in contrite worship. That's a great statement. I love that. So we're told about the sacrifices. You can't enter God's presence lightly. And, of course, we see Nadab and Abihu. Somebody said in here their favorite book is uh, Strange Fire, I think. Uh, Well, of course, it comes from this incident, doesn't it? Where they offered strange fire before the Lord and they were consumed. Um, You know, Diane just shared with me recently a devotional she read, I think by Johnny Erickson, where Johnny points out God takes sin seriously. I mean, Moses and Aaron couldn't enter the land because they sinned even though they're so godly, right? So, sin is, sin is, uh, sin is defiling and uh, God, God is uh, infinitely holy. So, the sacrifices are given so that we can find a way to, to, to live in God's midst. That's, that's the purpose of the sacrifices. That's the purpose of the The covenant, the new covenant is also instituted with blood. Uh, The sacrifices provide atonement. Um, So many people contest this today. Uh, Many people contest this understanding of the atonement and of blood. And uh, so the pouring out of blood, I think, means the surrendering of life. You know, there's some very mystical views out there about the blood. Are you familiar with these? Some people argue it's like the release of life, but in the sense of somehow there's a kind of almost magical properties in the blood. But this pouring out of blood signifies what? Death. So, I mean, the ancient world, they, you know, they they saw that all the time. You, you, You spill someone's blood and they die. I mean, probably at least some of you in this room have never seen that happen, right? (laughs) The spilling of a blood and seeing actually someone die. 
we, at least in the Western culture, we, we hide death from our, from our eyes, even the death of our animals. So the sacrifices are representative and substitutionary. I believe that the hand being laid on the animal is the transfer of the sin. And Gordon Wen Wenham, do you know that name? I give you a lot of names, sorry. But the Wenham family has been an amazing family. John Wenham, their father, and then Gord, uh, John, John wrote Christ in the Bible. That's still a book worth reading. Um, and then his two sons, Gordon is an Old Testament scholar and David's a New Testament scholar. And uh, we had Gordon at Southern. He gave us some in very interesting lectures on Christ and the Psalms. And that book, by the way, that book is out. I don't know the title, but it's worth reading. But Wenham says, what the worshiper does to the animal in sacrificing, he does symbolically to himself. The death of the animal portrays the death of himself. In other words, it's substitution. He says, the animal is a substitute of the worshiper. Its death makes atonement for the worshiper. Its immolation, it's burning up, that's what he means, on the altar quietens God's anger. It propitiates, right? It propitiates God's anger at human sin. Now, you might think, well, of course, I believe that. But, you know, there's, there's a lot of Old Testament scholars who don't argue that. And it's great to see Wenham arguing that case. I think, that's, I think that is correct. So substitutionary atonement is under attack. I haven't, I haven't read the book, Fleming Rutledge. Any of you read it? That book? You heard of it? It won the Book of the Year Award from Christianity Today, but I was talking to Steve Walm and Bruce Ware about it at Southern. Fleming Rutch, Rutledge, I forget the name of the book. It's a, but it won the, her book this year won Christianity Today Book of the Year Award, but it really doesn't hold the penal substitution. It's quite unfortunate. So, so penal substitution is, you know, under attack in so many quarters. And I hope you see in the Old Testament itself, it's there. The Day of Atonement in Leviticus 16, right? Leviticus 16, that's a chapter you should know. You should know that Leviticus 16 is about the Day of, the, of Atonement. Day of Atonement in one day a year, Yom Kippur, right? One day a year, sacrifice for sins. Only one person can go in the most holy place, and only once a year. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? God, God's holiness is so great that to go into his very presence in the Old Testament, only one person in Israel can go. And only once a year can they do that. That is quite remarkable. The, Azazel, one goat, bears the sins into the wilderness, which symbolizes death and chaos. The two goats together, the one that's sacrificed, and Azazel, right? Do you remember that? Azazel, they confess their sins over Azazel and send Azazel into the wilderness. So the one goat goes into the wilderness with the sins confessed. The, I agree with those. He go, the, the goat goes in the wilderness to die. It's the place of death and chaos. The other goat is sacrificed. Both those goats together represent what the atonement is, both death and departure. Atonement and removal of sin, purification and expiation. So this, this chapter in the middle of Leviticus is crucial to understand the biblical story. Of course, we know in light of the New Testament, don't we, that finally animal sacrifices can't forgive sins. They never forgave sins. They only forgave sins in that they pointed to the sacrifice of Christ. If, I, if righteousness could come through the law, including animal sacrifices, then Christ died for nothing, right? If the, if the sacrifices of animals could ultimately atone, well, then let's just be content with that. But of course, they can't ultimately atone. They point to the fact that God provides forgiveness for his people. And the animal sacrifices point forward to Isaiah 53, and the death of the servant of the Lord. Then Leviticus talks about cleanness. 
So that's all very, you know, you have the, the clean food, skin diseases, bodily discharges. My, uh, my first son, he, uh, Daniel, uh, he, uh, he, went, he did an internship at Capitol Hill Baptist Church with Mark Dever. He decided he wanted to stay there and learn more about the church. So he got a job um, in Washington, D.C. This will probably be on some exam sometime. But um, he got a job in Washington, D.C., and he ended up being um, like the office manager for the National Pork Producers Council, which is a lobbying group for the pork industry, right? Pigs and bacon, pork chops, so forth and so on. But I, this is, see, I mean, this is just a commercial here, but a little, uh, but what was fascinating, he was on the same floor with the Jewish lobbying group and the Muslim lobbying group. But they were never invited to the pork producers' council's parties, right? Because they don't eat pork. <laughs> so, I thought it was so interesting. They were all on the same floor together, but they really couldn't have good fellowship. Um, anyway, like I said, that's not in the exam. 